Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight and joining us on, on a truly special evening. I'm Pete Crane, the Vice President of Education and Access here at the National World War II Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you with us tonight, both those who are with us here and those who are joining us online. I'd like to start with what is always my favorite piece, uh, it, by recognizing those who, uh, those who are the purpose for this uh, institution. I'd like to recognize any Holocaust survivors, World War II veterans, or home front workers who are with us tonight. If you could, and I know we do have at least one, uh, if they would just stand or raise your hand and be recognized. I'd also like to recognize any other veterans that we have with us tonight. If you ever served in uniform uh, for this nation, if you would, just go ahead and raise your hand or stand up and be recognized. I would also like to recognize some very special friends who are with us tonight, uh, friends from our board or our presidential advisor families. We have Ann Abbott with us tonight, and I believe we also have Gunter Bischoff with us, so thank you. And finally, I'd like to thank our very generous sponsor, the Toby Philanthropies. Um, the Toby Th Philanthropies is the generous sponsor of uh, our Toby Holocaust education program here at the museum. Uh, two years ago, exactly today, uh, I was blessed to be able to represent the museum at the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Uh, this was my entry card for that day. And it was a life-changing event for me. So it just underlines the importance that after 75 years, and now 77 years after that liberation, that now more than ever, it is critical that we share the experiences of those who survived the Holocaust, and in the wake of those in, who would deny that it happened, or anti-Semitism that is running uh, rampant, that we educate the next generation and give everyone the opportunity to learn from the experiences of those who came before us. It's through programs like this one, part of the Toby Holocaust Education Program, and the construction of our capstone exhibit hall, the Liberation Pavilion, which will explore the Holocaust along with immediate post-war years and World War II's continuing impact today, that the World War II Museum is dedicated to educating the current and future generations about the horrors of the Holocaust so that nothing like that could happen again. This evening, we're grateful to have Dr. Dory Katz join us to deliver our keynote address. Dr. Katz was born in Antwerp to Polish and Czech parents the year before the Germans invaded and occupied Belgium in 1940. With the exception of Dory and her mother, who survived separately in hiding, her father and the rest of her family were deported to Auschwitz. Reunited after the war, she and her mother came to the, to the United States in 1952. She went on to earn a PhD in comparative literature from the University of Iowa and is currently Professor Emeritus of Modern Languages and Literature from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. There, she taught French and modern European literature for several decades. She's published many poems and translations from French in anthologies, journals, and reviews, and has published a, bi a bilingual book of poetry, Hiding in Other People's Houses, with her poems translated into Spanish. Her memoir that we're going to be uh, talking about tonight, Looking for Strangers, The True Story of My Hidden Wartime Childhood, was published by the University of Chicago Press in October of 2013. It was a finalist for an award from the National Jewish Book Council in 2013. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dory Katz to the stage for her presentation.
<clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say how honored I am to be speaking in this fabulous museum, World War II Museum, which my husband and I were able to look at some of the uh, exhibits this morning. It is an incredible museum. And so thank you very much for inviting me. I'd also like to say that I'm very grateful to be able to have lived as long as I'm living because like every Jew in German conquered countries in Europe, I was destined to be exterminated as, um, like everybody else. As you know, the one C conference in 1942, which was a conference attended by Himmler and Eichmann and others, decided to solve the Jewish question uh, once and for all by the final solution, which was basically extermination. Not that Jews hadn't been killed before 1942, but in this, with this conference, it was decided that every single Jew would be exterminated sooner or later. So I'm very lucky to have escaped that. I'm from Belgium, as the introduction uh, said. Now, Belgium in 1940, Belgium is a very small country anyway, but in 1940, Belgium had about 8 million plus uh, inhabitants and a Jewish population of about 57,000. Of the 57,000, 95% more or less were immigrants from Eastern European uh, countries and did not have Belgian citizenship. They were, of course, the first to be deported, but not that it helped being Belgian if you were Jewish, because as of 1943, all Jewish Belgian citizens were deported and killed like everybody else. But out of the Jewish population of Belgium, about 44% were killed. Just by comparison, uh, its neighbor to the south, France, in France, 22% of Jews were killed. In the Netherlands, 71% of Jews were exterminated and killed. And in Luxembourg, which had a very small Jewish population, 55% of Jews were exterminated. My mother uh, had come from Poland uh, to Belgium to join a brother whom she loved. She was only about 18 at the time, and her brother with his wife and daughter and son lived in Antwerp, and so that's where she wandered up. My father had come with his family and six siblings from Czechoslovakia and settled in Antwerp, and they met, married, and had me. Antwerp had a large Jewish population, uh, very active culture, theater, music, and so on, around the, the industry of diamond. My family, unfortunately, or fortunately, not that it would have mattered, was not involved with the diamond uh, business. I was born then in Antwerp in 1939, less than a year before the Germans invaded Belgium, which they did in, on May 10, 1940. The battle didn't last very long. German defeated the Belgian army very easily. And so as of uh, May 20th, when Belgium surrendered, the Germans occupied Belgium and stayed until February 4, 1945. So the Germans occupied Belgium for about f over four years. The war was over in Belgium, but of course the war was not over, so that the Germans plundered Belgium for goods to feed their own army and sustain the war. So goods became very scarce and life difficult rationed in Belgium. Uh, the prosecution of 
Jews in Belgium followed the regular pattern. The first thing the Germans had to do is to identify who is Jewish. The Germans considered a Jews, Judaism, a, a, not a religion, but a race. But they had to determine who was Jewish. Usually it was determined by the number of grandparents that one had who were Jewish. It varied slightly from country to country, but usually it was two to three grandparents uh, then you were Jewish. The second step to uh, once they had identified who was Jewish was to separate the Jews from the rest of the population which they did by forcing them, even in Belgium, to move into cities and also by having curfews. Jews could not go to uh, certain parks, uh, or couldn't go to stores after certain hours. Uh, they were, of course, not allowed uh, to continue practice their profession in academia, in medicine, in uh, communication, and so on. Many of the schools were closed, and uh, they had to sit in separate places. So it was a way of separating the Jews from the rest of the population. Now, the third step, of course, was to arrest Jews, and then to transport them to the various concentration camp to be exterminated, which is the fourth step. Now, what they did in Belgium, when I suppose when any uh, foreign country occupies, first of all, uh, you had to have an identification card. Everybody had to have an identification card. And so when Jews went to register to have an identification card, which they did uh, because they, didn't, they wanted to follow the law. And of course, in 1940, nobody could have predicted what would happen. So uh, when you went to register in City Hall for your identity card, if you were Jewish, on your identity card, you had a big J stamped for Juif, which is a French word for Jew, or Yud, the German uh, word for Jew. So all Jews on their ID had a J. So anytime they were stopped, asked for ID, the person who stopped them knew they were Jewish, even before they had to wear the star, the Star of David. And these um, registration for the ID card were made in duplicate, and the Belgium City Hall then turned over one set to the Gestapo. So on uh, the registration, the name, the name of the spouse, the address, the children, and so on. And so when the Germans began arresting Jews, all they had to do is look at the register and go to the address listed. They also arrested people on the streets in another event, but it was an easy way uh, for them to find uh, Jews. My family, my mother and father living in Antwerp uh, with me, they had a shoe store. That's how they made their living. Maison Finor, the name of their shoe store. Of course, when the Germans moved in, they had to put big sign in the uh, front window of their shoe store that said, this is a Jewish establishment, which of course meant they had a lot of graffiti, people would throw bricks sometimes, and after a while my mother uh, told my father that, uh, we, that they should sell the store, that uh, they should try to get out and move to Brussels. Uh, so they sold the store for almost nothing, and they moved to Brussels because they thought that they wouldn't be so known there, that it would be easier to be inconspicuous. As of 1941, all Jewish property in Belgium was confiscated anyway, and as of 1942, all Jewish companies in Belgium were eliminated. 
as of 1942, all Jews were forbidden to leave the country. It's not as though they could have left. Where would they have gone? No country took them in, including, as you know, the United States did not take Jews in, in after 1942. And um, as of 1942, then, people had to wear the yellow star, which, by the way, you had to buy. You had to go uh, to uh, the city hall and buy. Anybody over the age of six had to wear a, a yellow star. I'll tell you a little story that my mother told me that, uh, of course, uh, as I said, goods became so scarce, there were lines of all the stores. And my mother was waiting in line in front of a bakery with other women, and she was wearing her yellow star. And the woman behind her pushed her out of the line, and all the women laughed. And my mother stepped right back in the line. So the woman in front of her turned around and shoved her out of line. And my mother stepped right back. And they were pushing and shoving her. My mother very, was very strong. She just stayed in line. And then she got up to the counter, and the baker looked right over her and asked the next person, what they wanted, and my mother said, wait a minute, it's my turn. I've been waiting in line, it's my turn. And the baker said, I don't sell bread to Jews. And so my mother left the store, and she saw a Belgian policeman at the corner. And she went up to him and said, told him the story, and she said, I have a little girl, I have a three-year-old little girl, we don't have any bread, and the baker won't sell me any bread. And so the policeman looked at her and took her by the arm and walked her back into the bakery and told the baker, sell bread to this woman, and if you ever do that again, I'll see that your license is revoked. Now this is very interesting because it sort of shows that the reaction of Belgians was mixed. Some people, like this policeman, were sympathetic, and others, like the women, were not, and we were making fun, and were very, very uh, anti-Jewish. And you were, of course, very vulnerable wearing the star, and so, uh, so my mother and father and I, living in Brussels, my father was a redhead. He had light red hair and big blue eyes. He didn't, quote, look Jewish. And I was just like him. I had long, blonde hair and uh, green eyes, and uh, I was daddy's little girl. I was always on his lap and et cetera. And uh, one day, there was a knock at the door, and uh, my father's uh, sister-in-law from Manish, the name of his oldest brother was Manish, uh, was there, and she said she was all panicky, and she told my father that her husband, his brother, had been arrested by the German, and was being held in a, northern, in a prison in northern Belgium. It turned out that he was being held in SOS Toad Engineering Company, which was an engineering company that was manufacturing weapons for the Germans and that was situated in northern Belgium, which at first used uh, Jewish labor and after a while Belgian labor. And anyway, uh, my father's sister-in-law said that she had heard that one of the guards in, in this uh, prison was corruptible and that for a certain um, amount of money, he would let her husband go. And she had the money. She was supposed to meet this intermediary man who would turn over the money uh, to this guard, but she was afraid to, to go and do that, maybe because she was a woman. And she asked my father if he would go in her place. And my father said, of course, of course, I'll go. And uh, my mother was not very happy with that. But anyway, 
uh, the next day, my mother walked in the kitchen and my father was putting my coat on. I was three years old, was putting uh, my coat on and my mother said, what are you doing? And he said, you know, I'm going to meet this man, I have the money, and then Dory and I are going to take a little walk together. We haven't done anything in a long time. And my mother said, no, 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 absolutely not. It's too, and he said, why not? And he, she said, no, 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 uh, it's too dangerous. And, and so I started screaming, I want to go with daddy, I want to go with daddy. And so my father said, tell you what, I'm going to go meet this man, and then I'll come back and get you, and we'll go for a walk. In fact, he said, don't take your coat off. I'll be right back. And you can watch me from the window, from the kitchen window. I could look out on the sidewalk, and I could see him. And so finally, I was talked into doing that. And I stood by the window with my coat on, and I watched my father, who was a big joker, and he pretended to fall, you know, and waved and danced. And I waved, and he turned a corner, and I never saw him again because what happened, the, there was a Gestapo waiting two blocks away, and my father was arrested right then and there, and this was September 10th, 1942. And uh, he was sent to Malines, which is in, uh, in the north of Belgium, which was kind of a clearing center, where some Jews, when they were arrested, uh, were sent to this prison and they were cleared, the papers, uh, the, their goods were confiscated and they were deported from Malines. So my father was sent uh, to Malines on September 10th, 1942. He stayed there for a month and he was deported in October 10th, 1942 on convoy number nine which a train which held 398 men, 390 women, 121 children, 29 people out of this thousand or so survived. 1942, because of the Wannsee Conference, is when deportation, arrest and deportation, really accelerated not only in Belgium, but all over. All my relatives, and if you allow me, I just would like to say their name, were arrested in 1942, in, in the summer of 1942. Ethel, which was my father's sister, with her husband and her one-year-old little boy, Leo, deported. Manus, which was the oldest brother that my father tried to save. Rosa Malvina, his sister, deported in 1942. Bertha, another sister, reported, deported in 1942. Another sister who has my, my name, Dora, Dora, who was 16, was deported in 1942. And his young brother, Benjamin, who was an adolescent and who by some miracle is the only one who survived. What happened to my mother's brother and wife and two children who were living in Antwerp with her, I don't know when they were uh, deported, I think in 1942. As for my mother's family, when she had moved from Poland to go to uh, Belgium to be with her brother, she had left not, not only a sister, but also her parents and many siblings. I don't know what happened to them. They disappeared. It's just as though they never existed. They, they just were gone after the war. So after my father was arrested, when he didn't come home, my mother suspected what had happened because he would never have stayed out. So she, she was, and then when, every, when all these other people started disappearing, life was really nightmarish and very, very frightened. And what happened though in 1942 as the uh, deportation increased, 
so did actually the resistant movements began to be much more active in Belgium. Also, you remember that uh, the Germans were defeated in Stalingrad, and that also really seemed to have turned the war and sort of encouraged people to fight and resist. And uh, although uh, when people were arrested, they didn't always know that they were going to be sent to a concentration camp to be exterminated, uh, they were told they were being relocated to a labor camp and they would be with their family and live and work and so on. But nobody ever came back. And why arrest children? Why deport children? And so the, one of the resistant movements in uh, Belgium was called the White Brigade. And what they specialized in, what they devoted themselves in, is to saving children, to save children, to try to save children by hiding them by hiding them. And so my mother was contacted, and uh, at first she absolutely refused because my father was gone, her husband, her brother, all her sister-in-laws, cousins, uh, et cetera. She, and there we were, she just had me, and so she did not want to be separated. She said, no, no, she did not want to give me up and put me in hiding. But, one day, uh, she was walking down the street with me, and she was wearing the yellow star, but she had a scarf around her neck, and the scarf covered the star, so that it wasn't so visible to everybody that she was wearing the star. And we're walking along, and a young German soldier stopped us. He wasn't Gestapo. He was a, a soldier. My mother told me that he looked like he was 17 or something. He looked very young. And he stopped her and he asked her for her ID. And my mother said, told me, she doesn't know what happened. She just snapped. She just, just lost it. And instead of showing her ID, she started screaming at the soldier. Why? Why should I show you ID? Why always asking for ID? I'm sick and tired of showing us uh, IDs and on and on. And, but she said, he didn't get mad. He kept looking at me. He kept looking at me and smiling at me. And, um, and he finally uh, said, oh, your little girl is so cute. How old is she? And my mother said, three. And you know, I'm sort of hiding behind my mother. And he's squatting, he says, hi, little girl. And he said, oh, he said, I have a little girl back home, and she's three, and I miss her so much. And your little girl reminds me of my little girl. And then he asked my mother, are you Jewish? And my mother says, no. She says, no, she's wearing the star. She just says, no, but he must have seen her nervousness or something. And he said to her, you know what? Even though you're not Jewish, don't keep walking on the street. Turn around and go this way. There are Gestapos waiting around the corner, and they will get you if you keep walking down the street. And so my mother took me by the hand. We turned around and walked back. And that night, she decided that she had to put me in hiding. And so uh, she was contacted and told exactly how to proceed. Uh, she was going to uh, pack a suitcase for me, go to a Gare du Midi, a, a train station in Brussels. She was told to wait on a certain quay with me and that a woman would approach her and would ask if I had been a good little girl and she was to turn me over with the suitcase to this woman and walk away. And so, uh, my mother said she tried to prepare me the night before. She said, uh, we're going to play a game. We're going to go in hiding. I'm going to hide, and you're going to hide, and you're going to hide with really nice people. And I, you know, three years old, I don't know what I understood. And I think I said, why can't we hide? I want to play with you. And she says, no, no, it's OK. And so the next morning, uh, we got up and uh, walked uh, to the train station. 
uh, with my little suitcase, and a woman came up to me and said, uh, has she been a good little girl? And my mother said yes, and uh, she turned me over and the suitcase to this woman and ran away. You know, it's very strange. This is really the first, my first conscious of my life is the scene on the train. Even though I was only three years old, I remember my mother and I remember hearing because my mother ran and her heels sort of hit the pavement and I started screaming and crying, mommy, mama, mama. My mother said she went into, she said she had to run. She said if she didn't run, she could not have gone through with it because of course you were not supposed to know the person who took your child in hiding. You were not supposed to know where the child was being taken. It was too dangerous. So it had to be absolutely on fate. And there had been stories of people hiding children and then turning them over to the Gestapo. Not many, but it was very scary. And so my mother was very, very scared. She said she went into a cafe and you know, uh, went to the bathroom and just shoved her fist in her mouth so people wouldn't hear her sobbing. And I then, the woman who took me, I found out later, was a woman by the name of André Guélin. She was 21 years old. She was a school teacher. And she had seen all the empty seats in her classes and was very concerned about her Jewish uh, students. So she had joined uh, the resistance. So I was taken to Bercil, which is a small town, which seemed to me another world, but is not that far from Brussels. And I was taken to a, a couple of farmers, uh, Franz and Regine Walshaw, and uh, Aunt Madame Guélin, uh, brought me over and just left me there. And of course, immediately left because it was very dangerous. She had to, to leave immediately. And uh, this was an elderly couple whom the resistance paid 30 francs a day for my upkeep. And uh, they had two, three children. Two of them were already grown and uh, not living at home, and they had a 14-year-old girl in their old age. They had, had another child, 14-year-old girl, Jeanne. And they took me in. And I was so lucky. They were wonderful. They really loved me. And Jeanne uh, became my oldest sister. For her, I was like a little sister that had brought. And uh, also, I was living on a farm, so I ate well because they were growing vegetables, they had chicken, and so on. And uh, especially the uh, father, Franz, uh, and I immediately latched on to him, and he sort of became my surrogate father. Uh, I went, they told the village that I was the daughter of one of their nieces whose husband uh, had gone to work. Uh, you know, after a while, uh, the males in uh, all able-bodied males were supposed to work for the German in their industries. Service de travail obligatoire, you know, uh, oblig obligation uh, uh, work, labor. And so they told uh, their neighbors in the village that I was the uh, daughter of one of their nieces and the niece was sick and couldn't take care of me. So they had taken me in. So I went to uh, church with them, which I really liked because uh, there were stained glass windows of Madonna and child, which I de identified with my mother and I. And being a Catholic, uh, church, you knelt on straw chairs, and so you had all these patterns on your, of the straw on your knee, which I found fascinating. And of course, there was a big uh, meal after the church. My mother, meanwhile, what the uh, resistance did for her, 
gave her a false ID. With a new name, she stopped wearing the yellow star. And I really don't know how she survived. She did all sorts of labors, uh, worked as waitress, uh, cleaned houses, did whatever it took. But she was very, very worried about me. And um, she kept nagging her contact that she had to see me. She absolutely had to see me to make sure that I was OK. And at first, they really resisted. But after, my mother is very persistent. And so after a while, uh, they said, OK, and they arranged it. And uh, this is what happened. One, uh, one of the, once the son of uh, the people who were hiding me uh, had a uh, electric appliance store in downtown in Bercille, in the village. And uh, like typical of Belgian stores in those days, there was a courtyard uh, behind the store and a tool shed at the bottom of the courtyard. And so I was brought to the uh, store uh, by Jeanne, my 14-year-old uh, sister, and I was left in the tool shed. And my mother took the train and came to Bercille and went into the store. And if no, when nobody was in the store, she just crossed the courtyard and opened the tool shed, and there I was. And she immediately, of course, burst into tears. At first, it took me a little while to recognize her, but after a while I did. And um, she kept saying, you remember me? Remember who you are? My mother was so scared that I would forget who I am. And she kept saying, remember that you're Jewish. And remember not to tell anybody ever that you're Jewish. So it was like, remember, but don't tell. Remember, but don't tell. And after a while, I said to her, OK, I don't want to play anymore. I want to go home with you. Uh, and she said, no, no, not yet. And so uh, she, being a Jewish mother, had brought me food and, uh, <laughs> and uh, insisted that I eat it right there in the shed so she could watch me eat the food that she had brought. Of course, Mama Jean, the, the woman uh, that, who was hiding me, didn't want me to go meet my mother on an empty stomach, so she had given me a big meal. So. Uh, I ate this food, and uh, needless to say, that evening I was very sick. <laughs> and so uh, when my mother left, uh, and she kept saying, uh, you know, not yet, not yet, uh, you know, soon we'll be together, and uh, she left. And uh, Jean came and got me, and I went home and threw up and was very sick. And I think it was more than the food that made me sick that evening. But I don't remember when I was reunited with my mother. I think when the Allies came, and even though at first the war was not quite over, my mother and I were uh, reunited. I don't have a memory of our reunion. I remember living with her after the war. But it's interesting that I remember our separation, even though I was only three. And our reunion, I must have been five and a half or six. But I don't have any memory of that. And so uh, my mother and I uh, lived in Brussels after the war until uh, 1952, when uh, a man that my, mother, that my father had been in Auschwitz with uh, did, became our sponsor and did the papers so that we could come to the United States. Now, very few people survived, but some people did. And I think deep down as a child, I always thought my father would show up one of these days. And I think that when we left Belgium in 1952, it was kind of an admission and a recognition on my part that my father was not going to ever come back, that he was dead. And so after the war in Belgium, when I was growing up in the 40s, late 40s, um, I, was, I never would tell anybody that I was Jewish or what had happened to my family. I was ashamed of it. 
And I told my little playmates in school that my father had been a soldier and he had been killed fighting the German. He died on the battlefront. And uh, when we came to, and my mother, when we came to the United States, of course, I loved the United States. Uh, we uh, settled in California, in San Francisco. Wonderful. And uh, uh, I just, uh, there were so many different kinds of people. It was wonderful. I felt I didn't feel so conspicuous. And when I would ask my uh, mother about my years in the war, she would never talk about it. She kept saying, you were a child. What did, you don't remember anything. For you, it was nothing. You were only a child. And so, you know, I sort of didn't think about it for a long time, but I don't know why when I sort of became older and older, in my early 40s, actually, I really had the need to find out what happened. I really wanted to know, who were these people who saved my life? Are they still alive? And um, anyway, I found out, and, and this is the story in the book, I found out that there were records in Belgium that I might be able to find uh, the answers to uh, what I was searching. And so in uh, 1982, I went back to Belgium and I went to the Minister of Public Health, uh, the civil, which had a division for the civil victims of the war. It turned out that after the war, the Germans, and you probably know, the Germans were fanatical record keepers and paper keepers, and this was before electric typewriters even, but there were lots of records, and they had turned them over to this Ministry of Public Health, and there were records there. And so I went back to Belgium, and I went to Brussels uh, to uh, find out what there was, and sure enough, what I found, first of all, a folder with, in my father's name with everything about him, when he was arrested, who arrested him, where he went, first went, uh, when uh, he was admitted to Auschwitz, uh, and then he disappeared. And uh, I found out about me. I found out uh, a book, there were seven, two books. One book was uh, the name of people hiding children with code names, and another book, the name of children. And you know, I had a mixed reaction. The first reaction, I thought, my God, I could have been killed. <laughs> you know, really a gut feeling I understood. And the other reaction was, wow, all this effort to save me. And I was so uh, grateful that that happened. And so I'd like to just mention uh, to honor Regine and Franz Walshad, who were the people who took me in during the war. When I went, they were already in their 50s during the war, and I remember them as old, but I thought, oh, a three-year-old, anybody seems old. But in fact, uh, when I went back, thanks to the records, I was able to find a farm uh, where uh, one of their granddaughters uh, lived. Uh, but I was there in July, and in July all of Belgium takes vacation, so nobody was there, but I saw, I saw the house. And so I want to honor these wonderful people. Uh, what I also found then, after I was in Belgium, I went to San Francisco to uh, see the man who had made the papers and who had sponsored us uh, to come to America. My mother and he had had a falling out and so we had left San Francisco for Los Angeles and lost touch. But, uh, and he told me the story of my father. My father lived uh, till 1945 and he was um, one of the 
evacuees of Auschwitz. The Russians were marching on Auschwitz. The Russians liberated Auschwitz. And before they came, uh, the Germans made all the inmates who were still alive leave and march through the woods in, in 1945 in Poland in January. Many, two, I think I actually have to figure somewhere there. Yes, uh, 250 surviving inmates died in those marches during the war, including my father who just uh, disappeared. And um, so I found out a lot of things in Belgium in 1982. It was an very difficult trip, but a necessary trip. And so if you'll allow me, I'd like to end my talk by reading a poem that I wrote about my father after I went back uh, to Belgium. The poem is in two parts. The first part is based on all the documents in the manila folder that I found in 1982 in the Ministry of Public Health. The poem is called Being There. For years, I tried to picture you alive. The photographs I have of you don't help. You are so still in them, unsmiling, getting married, and not a single one of us together. Who would have thought that you would appear for me in Brussels on the ninth floor of a public building in a room as still as a cemetery. Nothing but file cabinets, one log table, long table, a few chairs. Your whole life contained among the documents the Germans kept of Jews living in Belgium during the war. The story tells itself. You were a new Czech immigrant, an unskilled man living with wife and child on a palace street. Here is your canceled work permit, the date and place of your, of your arrest by the SS. Here is the number of the train that took you to Kozel, Germany. You are examined there. A number is branded on your wrist. And when you board the train again, you are a different man heading for camps in Poland. Blechhammer, Feldafing, you work, you live. Two years later, another paper, the Auschwitz document. You have arrived at your last destination in April 44. The war will end less than a year from now, but you don't know that as you line up to have your nose and mouth measured for racial signs. If only you could have lived a little longer. The paper shows you have lost half your weight, your teeth, but your hair is still red and your height hasn't changed. It's January 45. The Russians march on Poland. Auschwitz empties like an old bucket, springing leaks. The woods are jammed with people forced to evacuate. In the confusion of the bombs, the, no the noise, the smoke, the rush from trains, the Germans use their guns. It's cold. You die propped up against a wall, unnoticed, or on the road, behind a bush, under a train, your file doesn't say. When the smoke cleared, the liberators came, but you had disappeared. Part two is really a dream that I had. I really had this dream and when I woke up, I couldn't understand why I was so happy, why the dream made me so happy. And it's only in beginning to write the poem that I realized why. Just when I think I've lost you, you are sleepwalking beside me across a field of wheat. There is a light stone in the distance. We are trying to reach it. 
you are so thin and weak. Your shabby overcoat seems to weigh you down. I have to hold you up and pull you along. You don't say anything. Your mind is elsewhere, but I am determined to save you. This time, no one will take you away. You are not young as in your photographs, but bearded, unsteady, gray. The old man you would be today had you lived. When we reach the lighthouse, it is unlocked, deserted, full of sun. I make you hide inside. And don't come out, I say, no matter what, while I wait for the camp commander and the guards, the same commander who signed the Auschwitz document. Please, I say, when they catch up with us and surround the lighthouse, please, he is so old and weak, but the man doesn't hear me. In this dream, I do not exist. Then you come out again, dazed by the light, as though you had been sleeping for years and we had just awakened you. You looked right through me, but I felt such joy in seeing you again. I wasn't angry you had disobeyed or even sad when they drove you away, the car and motorcycle sinking in the distance wheat. This time, I had been with you till the very end. Thank you, and in no way my giving this talk allows me to feel that I have been with them till the end. Thank you. from the audience, both in person and online. If you are here in person and do have a question for Dory, please raise your hand so that I can come to you with a microphone. If you are watching online, please type your questions into the Q, or excuse me, into the comments or the chat feature, whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or Vimeo. When you reach me your culture, Yes, I did. I did uh, find out what happened to the young daughter, and in fact, uh, a couple of years. And we started writing to each other. She wasn't there. She was in Spain vacationing. I forgot. I, you know that. Like, I think the French do it in August. The Belgian do it in July. Uh, that everybody was gone, and then. Uh, I used to go to France a lot, and then one time when I went back, I went to Belgium and we, and we met, and I met her uh, husband and grandchildren. By the way, uh, when I met her, uh, we went to um, the, the center of um, Brussels, and there's a memorial there to the Jews that um, is a little bit like the Vietnam Memorial. It was a wall with the names of uh, every single Jew. And uh, it was sort of in a plaza, in, and it was locked because the night before it had been defaced, and there were swastikas all over. This was probably 1984, 86, I don't remember the exact year. Um, so. But uh, I went another time back to Belgium and I saw the memorial and saw my father's name and other names. So we have a question from our online audience, which is how often do you get a chance to tell your story? Well, uh, before COVID, <laughs> um, I actually, 
I live in New York City now I'm, since I, uh, we retired from Trinity College, and I've been involved with an organization called Facing History and Ourselves, which was created by two uh, young teachers uh, from Boston who wanted to develop curriculum uh, to teach the Holocaust in high school. And the organization took off. It's now international. It deals with all sorts of genocides. And uh, they uh, send me to a lot of schools. I go to schools and uh, sometimes teach a workshop and sometimes synagogue, sometimes other organization. And I, before COVID, I, I would tell my story. An off-the-wall question. Have you ever regarded the 17-year-old German soldier a guardian angel? Yes. <laughs> yes, you know. Uh, by the way, uh, what I, my story that I've told you is, is based on the stories my mother told me, but also what I found out when I went back to Belgium uh, in uh, 1982. I don't remember the story with the German, but my mother told me the story, and I thought, wow, we owe him our lives. It's just sort of, because he happened to have, well, he happened, he, he was a soldier, he was not Gestapo, and he, had, he was probably really yearning for his little girl, which I happen to remind him of. So he was our guardian angel, you're right. We have another question from our online audience. Have you visited Auschwitz? No, I have not. I can't bring myself to do it. I really feel I should, but I, I just cannot bring myself to go to Auschwitz. I think it's my failure. We have a question from our in-person audience. Um, what happened to your mother? Well, um, you, you mean during the war? I'm not quite sure how she survived, but uh, when uh, we immigrated to uh, California, uh, she learned English and uh, she, she had a job. She never remarried, but she always had a boyfriend. <laughs> so there was always somebody in her life. Uh, and um, in, in the book, the book goes back and forth. I also tell her story in Poland. And uh, the truth is, I could not have written the book uh, when she was still alive, because there's a lot of very personal stuff in the book, which she would have been horrified my saying, but which I thought was very important. Uh, well, I can say it now since she's not here. My, my, mother, my mother lost her hair when she was four years old. She was from a large, very poor family in a shtetl in Poland. And uh, she was sort of made fun of, of her other little kids uh, because she was bald. And I think in a way, that, and she rebelled. Instead of being a victim, she fought back tooth and nail. And so my mother never conformed. My mother always felt it didn't apply to her because she had never been accepted, she thought. And so I really think that part of her survival in Belgium, part of it is luck, let's face it. Luck played a great role. But my mother would just not conform often. She would just rebel and I think I think that helped us and so uh, she lived until the age of 90 in uh, California happy more or less um, what is the significance of the red door was that I'm sorry what, what is, is the significance of the red door <laughs> that's a good question you know it's Chicago chose it. <laughs> I didn't, but I guess it was I was opening a door to find the truth, and they had, and I liked it, so I said, "Yeah, go ahead and use it." But I, I you. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much for being here tonight and uh, being a strong voice 
that the world needs to hear and uh, the education that, that needs to continue. I am shocked that anti-Semitism uh, is alive and apparent today. Um, it's not just something that happened, you know, that we read about in a history book or, or that you're talking about happening years ago. Um, just several months ago, a small little incident happened in a hometown near us where my son actually walked around for several hours and picked up propaganda that was thrown on people's doorsteps. And I was just shocked at this, that this continues today. And I think that we all need to be aware of that and do whatever we can to continue to be, to help you and others be a strong voice about what happened and how terrible this is. So um, anyway, thank you for being here sharing your story. Um, I also need to echo my appreciation for today, Holocaust Remembrance Day, you being here and, and sharing your story. Um, I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity or the perhaps compulsion to address, as this gentleman is saying, the Holocaust deniers and that small group, the kind of uh, political fringe that identify themselves as more Nazi-like, um, are you involved in countering that, or, or do you have any kind of thoughts about ways we can perhaps be a stronger voice? You know, I haven't been politically active. I just hope that my going to school and talking to students uh, sort of humanizes everything and make them uh, more ready to, f to also fight anti-Semitism. But I, I've not been involved that much politically. Good evening. Um, I just wondered if the, the, uh, the farming couple that saved you and protected you during the war have, have ever been recognized at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem as righteous Gentiles? Yad Vashem in Jerusalem recognized people that saved Jews during the war, and I wondered if, they'd, if that had, and it was, was, had actually been the case. No, they're not, they're not on that wall yet, but um, that may still be a project. This will be our final question for tonight. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, being that we live in the strange times <laughs> that we have now, um, is there anything going on right now in America that kind of sets up some red flags for you as far as parallels and dynamics that you lived through and survived? Well, I, I, I think like every Jew, uh, anti-Semitism is very scary and uh, when, when it was happening in, in Belgium, I was a child, and so I was not, and I left Belgium, you know, although, as I said, when I came back and saw the swastikas on the monument, just uh, really uh, like a knife in, in that. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I worry about it. I worry about it a lot. And uh, sometimes I, I think, well, you know, people will fight it. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't quite know what to say about it, frankly. It's just uh, part of it, you know, is, is hoping that there are enough people to fight it and that it won't happen. Uh, there's so much. There's so many people to hate all of a sudden, you know, it's just sort of, uh, it's really awful. It's just, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not really answering your question. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, truly a, a humanizing uh, event tonight. Uh, it's very easy to get lost in the terrible numbers and the horror stories that you constantly hear. 
And here's the story of a little girl and her mother who survived. It's amazing. So thank you, Dory, for joining us this evening to share your inspirational story and so that we could not forget what had happened uh, and the depth of it. Uh, I will take a, do a shameless plug right now. You can see it over my shoulder. Uh, you can find Dory's book, Looking for Strangers, The True Story of My Hidden Wartime Childhood, in our museum stores and during regular business hours and also in our online store. I'd also like to again thank the Toby Philanthropies for sponsoring tonight's program, which is part of our Toby Holocaust Education Program. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to have people actually here again, and it's wonderful to have so many people joining us online. So please join us here again at the National World War II Museum. Thank you very much. <laughs>